Transmitter device activating. Coordinates set for Earth 2. Hey everyone, welcome to the Earth 2 podcast, the podcast where we explore the origins and development of the DC Comics multiverse and the legacy of their Golden Age characters throughout the Silver and the Bronze Ages of comics. I'm Peter Watson. And I'm David Steele. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us. This week we're doing issue 8 of The Spectre, The Spectre, the only member of the Justice Society of America to receive an ongoing title during the Silver Age of Comics. Issue 8 of The Spectre was published on the 19th of November, 1968. We're rattling through 1968. We I can't are, believe we're yes. at the end of 1968 already. At this point in time, my parents have been married for nearly eight months. Isn't that nice? Right, so <laughs> Pete let's cut to the chase. Do you want to tell mm. everyone about this gorgeous cover? This is a Nick Cardi cover and it mm. is amazing. At the top we have text that says... Dare you look into the eyes of the Spectre? And it's a brand new Spectre logo. It's huge. Very dramatic. It takes up about the top third of the cover. Yeah. And it's above the giant face of the Spectre who is grimacing at us. He looks yes. rather, rather annoyed. Mm-hmm. And he has a massive finger out pointing at you, the reader. Gosh. Yep. And there's energy flying off of this finger. Yeah, it's so powerful and dynamic, and that's all the cover is. Yeah. There's no background detail. It's all just this energy coming off of the finger. It is glorious. Not even a hint of what the story could be about or anything. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. We talked about this before we started recording. Both of our copies have a a Thorpe and Porter one shilling price stamp over the Spectre's (laughs) left eye. Yes. We should explain what that is to US listeners. Do you want to do it or shall I? I'll go for it if you like. Okay then. Yeah. (laughs) Back when these comics were first imported into the UK, the prices were 12 cents on the comic. But that's no use to us over here. They had to be repriced for the British market. And so a company called Thorpe and Porter were the ones who actually did this. And what they did was they got a lovely rubber stamp and they stamped the cover of every single comic that came over with a UK Mm. price. Mm -hmm. And yes, it is one shilling for this one. Yep. They are the same distributors who created a phenomenon, which I can't remember if we've talked about on here before, called the Double Double Comic, which was when they took unsold DC comics, usually four four or so at a time. Mm-hmm. whipped the covers off and bound them together under a big wrap brown cover that reused artwork from older DC comics and called them Double Double Comics. I've got about half a dozen of them, I think. There's a couple yeah, I've got a couple. I can't find. It's not just DC comics. I've got one that's got an Avengers comic in it. Everyone that I have has been DC comics. Ah, there you go. And everyone that I've ever seen, there's not been many. I'm pretty sure, actually, I've got one that has an issue of the Spectre, because it's really random. It was really randomly uh-huh. just grabbed from their, their overstocks piles, and as far as yeah. whoever they bought them from were concerned, they'd written them off and binned them, but no, they tore off the covers and repurposed them and sold them to news agents. I've got one that has the same comic in it twice. Yes, me too. It's probably the same one. Can you imagine being a child and getting that? I think it's a Wonder Woman one as well. Mine is an issue of one of the anthology comics, like Unexpected or House of Mystery or something. Mm. I've got one that's got a Captain Storm story in it, you know, that sort of thing. Excellent. I need to try and dig them out. I've got a feeling that I've posted the cover of one of them that we used one of the JLA JC team ups mm-hmm. when we did that particular issue. So if you're interested, listeners, you can check out our Instagram and scroll back to the middle last year and see if you can find that. So, yes, double double comics, Thorpe and Porter. So, a Thorpe and Porter price stamp is something you'll see very regularly, as Pete says, comics are imported to, to the UK yes. back in the 60s and 70s. And I have so many beautiful covers where there's a, a circular detail, maybe in pink or white or yellow, on the, the cover, and that's ruined forever by a Thorpe and Porter price stamp. <laughs> My copy of whichever issue of Hot Wheels it is that's got the, <gasps> the Neil Adams artwork has a Thorpe and Porter stamp right over a crucial detail. Cheers for that, Thorpe and Porter. You weren't thinking ahead for the secondary market decades in the future, were you? Anyway, no. that's enough, Thorpe and Porter. So now that we've rabbited on about all that, shall we just jump straight into the story? No, well, let's jump into the inside cover, <laughs> because we have to talk about this. Yes. We don't usually talk about this sort of thing, but on the inside cover, there's an advert for a, a race set, a NASA high-banked raceway by Revel, mm. and it's a, a kid holding up a box of this kind of Skelectrix-type racing kit. The banner says, go ahead, spoil him, it's Christmas. And that's all well and good. However... Down the right-hand side, right near the comic spine, there's a dotted line Mm. and some text. David, would you like to tell the listener what it says? (laughs) It says, clip this ad and leave where parents can see. (laughs) <laughs> They're asking you to cut off this gorgeous <laughs> Nick Cardi cover. Possibly the best cover we've had in the podcast so far. <laughs> well, it's certainly up there. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's definitely one of the best. That's contentious. Mm. It's certainly one of the most dynamic. Yes. Put it uh-huh. that way. Mm-hmm. I wonder, you know, are there boxes somewhere filled with coverless copies of Spectre Issue 8? <laughs> 
because well. people wanted this racing set for their Christmas. Imagine you clipped out this advert and left it where your parents could see it, and they didn't buy you that. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yes. You'd have ruined your Spectre issue 8 for nothing. <laughs> Listeners, did you own a copy of Spectre issue 8, and did you cut off the front cover and leave the advert lying around in the hope that your parents would spot it and buy this racing set? If you did, let us know, and we'll give you a shout-out and a mention. <laughs> Can you imagine? Anyway. Into the story now. Into the story. Now, it's another one by Jerry Grandinetti, and it's very involved. So we'll see how I got on. <laughs> Indeed, yes. But it also still has Murphy Anderson on inks as well. And uh, <laughs> Steve Skeets is the writer of this one. I think, so. is this the first Steve Skeets? I think it might be. Yeah. I know him mainly for some reason as an Aquaman writer. I don't really know too much else that uh -huh. he did. He does quite a lot of stuff around about this time. He's one of the, the new wave of writers they bring in. Yeah, I mean, it's not a name that I associate with the greats. But it was a name I was quite ignorant of for a very long time, but then it, I can't remember mm. when it was. Mm -hmm. I suddenly spotted that he actually did do, as you say, quite a lot of stuff. This is an interesting one. We'll see how we got on. Yes. We're, we were both a little trepidatious about starting it because it's very visual. <laughs> yeah. But of course, if you're one of our listeners who likes to read along, you should be okay. Oh, yes. And it's another one, if you're playing the Earth 2 podcast drinking game, you should be fully stacked up. A reminder for the listener, the Earth 2 podcast drinking game is every time a full moon looms in the background, you have to take yes. a drink. Yes. <laughs> right. So, we have an opening splash page. Which looks very much like one image, but it's doing that Jerry Grandinetti thing where it's kind of telling the story through multiple images within the same panel. Mm -hmm. At the very top left-hand corner, there's a massive prologue. And a little bit of text underneath it says, 18th century England, a student of the black arts looks on as his master performs a foreboding ritual. A ritual which no other mystic has ever dared perform. And what's very interesting, we see the roof of the interior of this building where this ritual is going on. And we can see the beams and inset into the beams as an exterior shot of the, the big old fashioned house where this is taking place. Very oppressive looking building with a full moon looming behind it. And then within the same panel border, we move inside the building. We can see the open doorway behind the, the student of black arts as he watches his master. And we can see through the open doorway, a full moon looming behind him. <laughs> The student looks like a kind of fairly smart guy. He's wearing a bow tie, fancy jacket, very neat facial hair. And his master in front of him looks a lot older, wearing a sort of druid's Gandalf cape outfit mm -hmm. type thing. Mm -hmm. And has a long straggly beard. He has his hands raised in gesture. And there's a little burning brazier in front of him. We can see a desk with candles and quill pens and bits of parchment and books laying around. And over the bottom of this opening splash image, we get a couple of closer shots of the master at work. And under the first closer shots of this gentleman, there is some text that says, Carefully, the old man utters a cacophonous incantation, then lets his mind go blank. And on the right-hand side of the page, there's another closer shot of him, and his eyes are wide and white. And some more text says, Slowly, an indescribable, unearthly force takes control of his mind, and... An eerie, piercing gleam comes into his eyes. Gosh. And over the page then to page two. Trance-like, he shuffles to a nearby desk and begins to inscribe occult symbols upon a piece of parchment. Yes, we can see he's doing this by candlelight. The older man hunched over the desk, scrabbling away, and his student is watching him, and his student thinks... It's working. He succeeded in compelling the supramundane forces to use his body as their medium. Now those forces are inscribing instructions through which the doorway to limitless power can be opened. Soon the master will become the most powerful being in this world, in all the universe. Yes, we have a nice closer shot of the, the master's hands scrabbling away in the parchment. And Jerry's doing that thing in this panel where it, the narrative flows through the... It's essentially two panels in one again that like we had in the last yeah. issue within the same panel borders. It's very effective. It's very, mm -hmm. very striking. We'll highlight it when it goes on, but we probably won't mention it every time because we'll be here all night. So, <laughs> in the next sequence, the student moves towards the open doorway and we can see his master is still scrabbling away in the background and we can also see a full moon looming in the, the window behind him. So as he takes his leave, the student is thinking, The master is an old fool. He would not use the power properly. He does not deserve it. I am much more deserving than he. If I could wrest the parchment from him once it is completed, the power would be mine. There's a nice sort of click, click, click range of sound effects here as he walks away down the corridor. That's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. There's a caption for the next panel that says, Deep in thought, the student walks down a long, dark corridor to his own quarters when... Yes, he looks back and we hear 
the voice of his master coming from the open doorway, crying, No, this must not be. It is evil. Far more evil than I ever expected. The student turns, looking a bit panicked and a bit of sweat on his brow, and he says, What? And he runs back down to the room. We can see the open full moon behind him. See, arrives in the doorway, looking at his master. The student thinks, He's come out of the trance, but what is he doing? The master is standing over the little burning dish that we saw in the opening splash panel. He's holding his scroll above it, and he's saying, I must destroy the parchment. Man was never meant to possess such power. The student approaches him, the first panel of the next page. Putting his hand towards his shoulder, he says, Master, you must not destroy that. Not after all we... Silence, Nakran. I shall do what must be done. This is pretty stunning, isn't it, really? Yeah. We get a close-up of Narkran within the same panel borders, and his mouth's wide open, and there's text written in his mouth, which seems to suggest that he's actually saying, No, I will not allow! Perfect. There's a caption for the next panel that says, With a twist of his wrist, the alchemist unleashes a mystical bolt. Yeah, there's a cracking zwip sound effect as the master gestures towards the boy, saying, Apprentice, do not argue with the master! As we move into the next panel, we see that Nakran has ducked down behind the desk that the master was writing on earlier on. As he ducks down, Nakran is thinking, I I cannot let him do this. If he does not wish to have the parchment, I do. We can see in the background that the master still hasn't burnt the parchment. He's still trying to. The narrative continues as we see Nakran looking at the candle that's burning on the desk in front of him as he thinks, But how can I stop him? He has undoubtedly placed a shield about himself to ward off any mystical spell I might try. The only alternative is... A physical blow. He's not equipped to handle that. And over these sequence of panels, we see Nakram grabbing the candlestick and lifting it up and bringing it down on the head of his master. There's a... from his master and a quam sound effect. We move to the top of page four. So again, we kind of get three images in one here. Close up of Nakram. We can see the master down on the ground in front of him. Nakram is thinking... He, he's dead. I was too anxious. Didn't mean to hit him that hard. But what does it matter? No one can make me pay for my crime, now that I have the parchment. He reaches down and grabs the piece of paper, and the final little part of this panel shows him reading through it, thinking, For soon, very soon, very soon, I shall have the ultimate power. And in the middle of this large panel, there's a caption that takes us to the next part of the narrative that says, And so it begins. Darkran reads the parchment, follows the directions step by step, Outre words are chanted, bizarre figures drawn. Yeah, it's very interesting, very effective. There's a shot of him with his eyes wide, almost in silhouette, with a full moon poking through the window behind him. <laughs> we see him scribbling on the ground, the little burning dish going on. It's very, very effective. All sort of lit in bright pink in the same way that the first part of the panel was sort of lit in bright orange. It's very interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Again, as, as I said before about Jerry Grandinetti's work, it's very EC Comics. I have to be honest, I haven't read very many EC comics, to be honest. You know, I'm familiar with the covers, I'm familiar with the idea, but I've never I've never really read many of them. It's stunning, it's great. So that comparison's lost on me, sadly, but it's <laughs> really different to just about everything that we've kind of accepted as the standard. So mm -hmm. it's really effective, and I think it suits the spectre, actually. Yeah, definitely. There's a final panel which shows all sorts of trippy nonsense. It shows Nadrak spinning away into the distance and open doors, and it looks like the desk is floating, and there's a weird... Very trippy background to the rest of it. And we're captioned throughout this, and the caption says, But before he can complete his reading, he feels the room begin to spin. Wild colours swirl around him as consciousness slips away. Moments later, he is floating through an eerie universe in another astral plane, floating past weird shapes. The parchment is gone from his hands, and... An uncanny sensation fills his body. Yeah, very effective. I should have said there was the sort of symbols sort of floating around him as he starts to spin off his bell, so that's obviously the effect of the, the text that he's written. You see that Nakram is surrounded by a, a golden glow. As he falls down through this hellish landscape, he is thinking, Power! I can feel myself growing more powerful. We arrive at the top of page five. Suddenly... And... He's continued to fall through this really weird background. We'll put this panel on the socials, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's, again, it's very Steve Ditko, Doctor Strange. -y. Yeah, Nakram is sort of falling. There's some weird purple and green and twisty shapes around him. And there's a big, what looks like sort of melting pink ice cream. <laughs> and he's yelling. Yeah! 
and it's lettered in a very unusual fashion. This is obviously either what he's saying or what he's thinking. Pain! Unbearable pain! Knowledge is entering my mind too quickly! My brain is reacting violently! Can hardly stand it! And then we have a sequence of four panels at the bottom of page five. The first one is a close-up of Nakran experiencing the pain. It looks at like those energy bursting out all around him and he's thinking... Must... Do something. Pain still growing can't take much more. If this is what it means to have power, then... And then in the second panel, it's like he's being surrounded by jaggedy yellow electricity. It's almost like it's firing out of him, and he's thinking... Uh, odd. The pain is subsiding. The growth of my knowledge must be levelling off. In the next panel, things look much calmer. There's a sort of very pleasant pink ripple effect going on around him, as he thinks. Ah, <sighs> the pain has ceased. But still I can feel my knowledge increasing, my entire body growing in mystical strength. And then we get a close-up of his face in the final panel of page five, lit with a very bright pink and red light as he looks utterly manic and thinks, My knowledge seems to know no bounds. I am aware of everything. I know the history of the entire cosmos. Gosh, wouldn't that be useful? It reminds me of that line in Monty Python when they talk about Dr. Bronowski. Who's Dr. Bronowski? He knows everything. I wouldn't like that. would take the mystery out of life. So we arrive at the top of page six, and there's like a staircase and some twisting blue and green energy. There's what looks like a glowing yellow sun with tendrils coming from it. Flames at the bottom of this panel. This is very trippy. Mm -hmm. And as Nakran soars through this, he thinks, Wait, I am becoming aware of something else, something hideous. Soon I will die. My human body cannot contain this ever-increasing power. Before long, I shall explode. And in the next little part, he's surrounded by whirling, twirly orange shapes. And as he seems to be falling downwards, radiating this energy, he's thinking, There must be a protection against this, a way to transform my body into something that will contain the power. The parchment. Now, we then twist 90 degrees to our left, <laughs> or is it to the right? <laughs> it's very interesting what Jerry's doing here. You have to turn the comic, yeah. you have to turn your comic sort of 90 degrees to your right to read as he's lit up in green and he's thinking in big letters. But I never finished reading the parchment. The last portion must contain the incantation through which this body can be transformed. And then we flip back to the regular axis, golden energy bursting around him as he flies forward. It looks like he's saying, I must return to Earth immediately. Find that parchment. My very life depends on it. Gosh. And a tiny caption says, Story continues and second page following. So the rest of this page is taken up with an advertisement for a model of the Cutty Sark. And there's an advertisement for some general electric equipment across the page. And then as we arrive, on page seven of the story. Now, it's another big Jerry Grandinetti <laughs> trippy extravaganza. I can count what looks like at least... Four or five, maybe? <laughs> full moons? I'm not sure. Maybe they're not all full moons. Maybe just one of them is. Mm. But anyway, we finally get the title of the story in this panel. The text at the top says, It is more than 200 years later, and as we look in on the spectre, we find him whizzing through various astral planes, heading towards Earth's universe, returning from an exhausting mission the exact nature of which is relatively unimportant to our present story. <laughs> well, that's all right then. <laughs> and in massive blue lettering, we finally get the, the name of this adventure, as we are told that we are reading The, the Parchment, Parchment of, of Power Perilous. Perilous. Gosh. I suppose that counts as the longest pre-credit sequence we've had, I suppose, doesn't it? Yeah, page seven, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the spectre's flying around through some trippy yellow and pink swirls, and as he does so, he's thinking been away from my alter ego too long. I'm beginning to feel the strain and fatigue. Must replenish my strength in Jim's body immediately. As the astral agent approaches police detective Jim Corrigan. Yes, yeah, is great. We're up above in the sky with the spectre looking down in an alleyway. Jim appears to be hiding behind a dustbin and there are three shady hoods who are casting shadows because of the lamp behind them. They're looking into the alleyway trying to spot Jim and the spectre looking at all this thinks... Looks like Jim has gotten himself into trouble. Those hoods have him cornered. The next panel, with a full moon looming in the background, Spectre flies down towards the alley as the goons open fire on Corrigan. We see a bow sound effect as a bullet ricochets off one of the dustbin lids. There was really obvious dustbins in this last issue as well, wasn't there? Yes, that's true. <laughs> Did Jerry like drawing dustbins? <laughs> I think he does. He might spend a lot of time in alleyways like, doing reference. <laughs> Yeah, if it's a Jerry Grandinetti story, take a drink every time there's a dustbin in an alleyway. 
Okay, as the spectre flies down towards this, he's thinking. But Jim's a well-trained detective. He'll get himself out of this. Besides, I have no time to worry about that now. And as we reach the top of page 8, we see the spectre flying down, trying to merge with Corrigan's body. Corrigan's thinking, what? Spec, entering my body. It's about time he showed up. And then in the second panel, we see that Corrigan is repelling the spectre and saying, Get out of there! Can't you see I'm in a jam? I need your help! The spectre replies, Jim, no, you do not understand. I must replenish my powers in your body. Can't you see I am dead tired? Tired? You don't know what tired is. He continues in the next panel, as they're both being fired upon by the shady hoods. Pew! Zing! Sound effects going on. <laughs> Jim continues to shout at the spectre, saying, I haven't slept for 48 hours. I spent all that time tracking down these three members of the Karstag mob. I'm so groggy, they were able to knock my gun away. So if I don't get your help, there may be no body for you to replenish yourself in. But says the spectre, and there's a couple of blams in the next panels. The bullets go whizzing past them. Corrigan says, No buts! Give me a hand, now, before they settle this argument with a bullet! And then a spectre, in a very huffy style, cries, All right, if you insist. With one blinding sweep of his arm, the spectre whips up eldritch energy, rendering the three gunmen unconscious. Yeah, he just kind of swings his right arm around. There's a rush of golden energy, a zwap! Sound effect, the bodies go flying. We can see Jim peeking out from behind the dustbin. <laughs> and Spectre says, There, it is done. And to the right of the panel, as the energy goes swishing, we can see a silhouetted, hatted figure standing in the pavement with a full moon looming behind him. We are told that we are continued in the second page following. We turn the page, we pass an advertisement for issue two of DC Special, which is one that I've got, I think, actually. And mm. as we arrive at the top of page nine... As the Astral Avenger continues his swing, he is unaware that his energy blast accidentally strikes a passerby. Yes, there's a continued zwoop sound effect, and we see this gentleman is sort of hit with a golden aura as he cries, Ugh! and falls to the ground. Caption for the next panel. And as the innocent victim slumps to the ground... We're back in the alleyway with Jim Corrigan as the spectre moves back into Jim's body, saying, Now, I want in. And as a moody shot of Jim Corrigan thinking, <sighs> Phew, never saw Speck act so rashly, almost without thinking. That blast could have killed these thugs. Oh well, he has his way of doing things, and a slow dissolve. That night, as Jim Corrigan grabs some well-earned rest... Yes, we're in Jim's bedroom. There's a nice painting of a of a sailing ship on the wall above him. I don't remember it being there on other occasions when we've been in Jim's bedroom. Um, we can see that Jim sleeps with his massive curtains open. It's obviously quite a posh place he's listening. We can see a full moon in the background. But most significantly, we see the spectre, in a very loosely drawn form, emerging from Corrigan's sleeping body. And the spectre is crying, Some force pulling me out of Jim's body. There's an inset panel. The spectre is flying up. It looks as though he's flying up through a, a massive torch beam. And he's thinking, I must be dreaming. Although I never experienced such a human phenomenon before. So then we arrive at the top of page 10. Page 10 already. And this is phenomenal. This is like, wow. Because we basically see amongst a big twisting staircase and some swans and a big floating giant harp and some columns. It looks as though the spectre has arrived at the pearly gates. It certainly has. And he's standing there looking very admonished, and a booming voice is saying, Agent of God, for abusing your powers, you shall be punished. Second part was amazing. We see the spectre with his head hunched forward. He's moodily lit in blue, and he's surrounded by doves. This is cracking. The, the big booming voice continues. You acted impatiently, without thought, as would an irresponsible human. And then less booming, but still, you know, floating around, little thought bubble panels. It, also looks, it looks as though the doves are talking to him, which is quite <laughs> funny. A voice nevertheless continues, saying, Because of your rash act, an innocent man was almost killed. If you choose to act like a human, so shall you be judged. And this final panel of page 10, it's doing that Jerry Grandinetti thing where the narrative progresses through essentially three panels worth, but we're only within one panel border. It's a very effective page, actually. It's gorgeous. I encourage anyone listening to seek out these Jerry Grandinetti issues of the Spectre, because as critical as I was about them not being the same in Neil Adams, they are something else. So there's a, mm -hmm. a lot more text from the big booming voice 
We see the spe- close of the spectre looking very, very unhappy as the voice continues. As, as punishment, punishment for your action, action you, you shall, shall be given a weakness. weakness. Like, like the mark of Cain, you, you shall bear this weakness, weakness always as a sign of your failing. And as a constant reminder that you must not fail again. Then it continues in the next little part of the panel, where again we see the swans and the the doves and the staircase and the floating harps and columns. Moreover, it has been decreed that your weakness shall change from time to time. It will become apparent only during times of stress, when you are most likely to act rashly. Remember... You have brought this upon yourself. And with that, it looks like the spectre is falling away from this set of pearly gates. He's surrounded by a bit of a pink aura. He falls back down. And then we arrive at the top of page 11, caption for the first panel. In his dreamlike state, the spectre is pulled back to Jim Corrigan's body. And that's what we see. Specs starting to zoom and merge into Jim's sleeping body. And then in a much closer shot of a sleeping Jim, we see the spectre almost curled up, almost within Jim's chest. It's very interesting. And the two sleep on, as though nothing extraordinary has happened. Gosh, we change of scenery for the next panel. Some time later, and quite some distance away, a strangely garbed giant slips into the plane of Earth. Yes, very effective, this. It looks as though it's Narkran, still lit up in bright pink, and it looks as though he's falling through a little pink void and appearing above Earth in space, and he's thinking. Incredible. My increased knowledge tells me that, although it seemed to me only a few minutes have passed, more than 200 years have gone by on Earth. He gets a manic close-up in the next panel, where he thinks, After all this time, the parchment is probably no longer in the Master's castle. Someone must have moved it by now. And page 11 concludes with a panel of Narkran. With his arms spread, he's surrounded by glowing energy. So he flies down towards Earth, thinking, But no matter. I shall find the parchment easily enough. Once I set foot on Earth, my infinite knowledge will tell me exactly where it is. This is stunning. Like, mm. how many planets are there in Earth's solar system? How many suns are there in Earth's solar Lots. system? How many full moons are there in Earth's solar yeah, system? because looking at this panel, there's at least two suns and about eight other planets. Must be a side effect of the astral plane. I think so. I think it's Earth through the filter of the astral plane or something or nothing. Yeah. So, we're at the top of page 12. As the man from the 18th century approaches, strange forces begin to erupt on Earth. Weird, unexplained currents of wind begin to swirl about. Yeah, it's a shot of a street. It looks like the streets at night time, unless it's during the day and that's the sun that's beating down. It looks kind of like a looming full moon. Yeah. We can see newspapers and other rubbish being blown about into the air. Caption for panel two. That morning, Jim Corrigan is about to head down to the station house. This great panel shows the spectre emerging from Jim's body. It almost looks like a big hole in the, the middle of Jim's chest. It's very effective. Mm. Spectre's popping out. Maybe he's going down to the shops. <laughs> he's saying, This weather is not natural. I can sense forces are at work. Corrigan says, Morning, Speck. Sorry I bit your head off yesterday. Guess I was really bushed. I understand. After all, I was in a bad way myself. In fact, I must have been far more exhausted than I thought. You'll have to tell me about it sometime. Right now, I'm in a hurry. I've got to track down the rest of the Karstag gang. Try to bust up that smuggling ring once and for all. Spectre takes his leave, flying out the open window, saying, And I am going to investigate these unearthly forces. This green ripple around him there, as it sort of blends into his cloak, it's very effective. Mm -hmm. And there's a great panel of the spectre flying up into the air that doesn't have a caption at all. That is phenomenal. Yeah, it's lovely. It It reminds me a little of that Western Johnny Thunder story we did when we did that showcase issue. Oh, of course, yes. Uh Remember the long shot of him jumping off the cliff into the water? It's Mm, kind of the opposite of that. Very nice. (laughs) Except it's a a very stick figure spectre (laughs) flying away up into the air. That's that's gorgeous. Remember last issue when we were doing a spectre and I was moaning about Jerry Grandinetti? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the scales have fallen from your eyes <laughs> I'm going to be Jerry Grandinetti's biggest fan I'm going to try and get a hold of everything that he's ever done about So, right, final panel of page 12 shows the spectre flying up away from Earth by the looks of it and it looks as though he's flying into the astral plane already because there's some weird planetary shapes floating around and as he flies along the big guy's thinking Strange, I cannot get that dream out of my mind I keep thinking of what that voice said about giving me a weakness. But this is hardly the time to think about that. I must concentrate on these weird forces. They are coming from something approaching Earth. And the spectre flies on into the first panel of page 13, almost like he's orbiting Earth, and we see 
the glowing giant figure of Narkran, and as the spectre flies towards him, he's thinking, A giant, dressed in clothing of the 1700s. I must grow to a comparable size if I hope to deal with him effectively. Who is he, I wonder? What is his objective? Even as the ghostly guardian enlarges himself? Yeah, it looks so Narkran is grinning at him. The glow around him certainly seems to intensify. Mm -hmm. And the next panel shows the spectre being struck by waves of pink energy which are coming from Narkran's forehead. Spectre recoils, thinking, His thoughts, so powerful, so overwhelmingly sinister. They are forcing me back with their sheer power. Now I know why he has come here. He's seeking a parchment through which he will become the most powerful entity in the universe. And the next panel's great, because they're sort of both standing up now, squaring up to each other. Specs thinking, But his power will be the power of evil, and with it he could overcome all the good on earth. My course is clear. I must not let him find the parchment. And as the spectre moves forward, and as Narkran glows brighter, Narkran cries, An earth spirit! Attacking me? Perhaps he wishes to keep me off earth because I present a threat to his power there. And the next panel, Narkran punches at the spectre, saying, No matter what his reason, he will not stop me. The spectre recoils, thinking, Although I do not feel pain, that blow nearly knocked me into another plane of existence. Got to strike back while I'm still all here. And then page 14 is a single panel, and there's a massive crack sound effect as the spectre retaliates, punching back at Narkran. We can see the soles of Narkran's shoes. The details here are amazing. Yeah. And there's tons of more planets and things spinning behind. And actually, what I said earlier on about flipping the comic 90 degrees to be able to read it, it's almost like the spectre and Narkran are both upside down. Yes. If you turn your comic upside down, it's much more effective. <laughs> and in the corner of this very effective panel, there's a text caption box that says... Thus the battle begins, with the spectre completely unaware of the catastrophic complication about to come his way in this supernatural saga, which continues on the third page following. <laughs> the rest of the page is taken up with an advertisement for issue 2 of Angel and the Eight. Yay! We pass the letters page for this issue, which talked about issue 6, which is fun. We turn the page with an advertisement for the 80-page Batman issue 208. Who is the most important woman in Batman's life? And we can see Poison Ivy and Batgirl, Batwoman, Catwoman. That's very effective. And Vicky Vale. Don't forget Vicky Vale. Oh, yeah. Is that her that's taken a photograph? Yeah. It's a very effective advertisement, which I'm sure has probably been covered in your favourite Batman podcast already. So we arrive at the top of page 15. The caption for the first panel says, Even as the evil Colossus reels back, he grabs hold of a meteoroid. Yes, we see that Narkran still glowing with energy, and actually in this panel he looks very much like 1980s Doctor Who script editor Eric Sayward. He does, actually. <laughs> Which is fascinating. He looks really annoyed. And if it is Eric Sayward, he's probably just read the, the latest draft of episode two of Time Lash. Yes. Which would make anyone annoyed. So he's got all <laughs> this meteoroid. He's going to strike the spectre and he's saying, This shall end your existence. You shall thwart my plans no longer. The spectre thinks, He vastly underestimates my power if he believes he can defeat me with a chunk of space matter. And a small inset caption says, But the next instant... Yes, the spectre's holding his hands up to his face and there's little bursts of energy and light floating around in front of his eyes. Spectre thinks, Everything becoming blurry. The next panel is essentially, I suppose, the spectre's point of view. We can see a blurry indicator of Narkran holding the meteorite towards him. And spectre's thinking, Could be using some force against me, some force unknown to me. The next panel's another shot of the spectre's point of view, but all details vanish now. There's just little bursts of light. And he continues to think, Now I cannot see a thing. And yet, I do not sense that he is using any power against me. And then, final panel, page 15. We see like a dark cloud drifting over the earth. As the spectre thinks, I have gone blind. And then there's some weird twisty text emerging from this sort of black cloud. As the spectre obviously realises, The dream! Yes, he's remembering the dream when he floated up to the pearly gates. We arrive at the top of page 16 and a very panicked spectre with the meteorite looming up in his personal space. The spectre's thinking, It was not a dream at all. I have been given a weakness. And this time my weakness is blindness. How am I? Uh, I sense something hurtling through space at me. The meteoroid. With the speed of thought, the spectre unleashes an energy blast. Yes, massive burst of gold energy. Almost reflexive, I think, from his hands. Strikes the meteoroid. The spectre thinks... A blind hit! That's a massive crag! Sound effect. It looks like the meteorite shatters. Caption for the next panel. The follow-up moment. Still glowing. Narkran punches the spectre in the stomach. It's great, actually, because his cape goes flying up over his head. It's very, mm. very interesting. The spectre thinks, That attack! I could not sense it! 
It's like a weirdly caricatured, grotesque Gil Kane. Really, the layout of this. Yes, it's a good shout, yes. Narkran strikes a, an uppercut of the spectre, punching him in the jaw, and the spectre reacts, thinking, No, this one! So he's getting pummeled, basically. Close-up shot of the spectre in the next panel, with the little dazzling lights bursting in front of him, and he's thinking, That blow could have hurled me into another astral plane! And the next one's a bit of a weird combination shot of the spectre lying on his back looking dazed and I guess a suggestion of his point of view of being complete nothingness as he thinks I have no way of knowing where I am. But then as we arrive at the top of page 17 the spectre gets to his feet. Narkran is there still glowing with golden energy and spectre thinks Hold! I can still feel the emanations of his sinister thoughts. I must be in the same plane. How can I fight him blindly and hope to overcome? In the next panel there's a weird sort of pink aura appearing around the spectre as he thinks, Got to try something by surrounding myself with circles of psychic energy. Acting like radar, the psychic waves give the spectre a picture of his false position. This is very effective, isn't it? It's a bit like you could imagine it being a Daredevil panel. Almost. Yes, it's very Daredevil. Totally ripped off from Daredevil. Yeah. <laughs> you see the silhouette form of Narkran and Spectre's pink waves sort of giving him a sense where he is. Spectre thinks... I know exactly where he is. Now to spring at him. But as the ghostly guardian lashes out at his antagonist... Narkran moves out the way. <laughs> the cheeky so-and-so. Spectre <laughs> thinks, Missed! How short-sighted of me to count on him remaining in the same position. You didn't think that through, big guy. Mm. The next little panel here shows Narkran lifting an even bigger meteor to hurl at the Spectre. Spectre still trying his waves of energy location thing. Spectre's thinking, I shall have to play this a different way. Retreat and await his next move. Again, this is very effective, the way this mm -hmm. is all laid out. There's a big close-up of the right-hand side of, of page 17 here, of the spectre looking very moody, while the left-hand side of the final panel of page 17 shows the meteor being hurled towards the spectre. We can see the, the spectre's little radar waves being bent as the, well, spectre thinks what's happening. Throwing something at me again, and judging from the image I am receiving, it is much larger than the other one, an asteroid! What's good enough for me will be more than bad enough for him. Ooh, the way he's thinking. And as we arrive at the top of page 18, thankfully, there's a caption so Peter can say, Judging the proper distance and angle via his radar image, the Astral Avenger emits a spectral bolt which forces the asteroid back. Yes, there's a massive zzzz as an energy burst from the spectre hits the asteroid and sends the asteroid hurling back towards Narkran as a crack sound effect as Narkran is struck, and the spectre thinks, Right on target. Now, while the impact has him off balance, I catch him with his guard down. This again, oddly structured sequence with the earth hanging in the background of it all, shows the spectre landing tons of punches on Narkran, and as he does all this, the spectre is thinking, There will be no escaping me as I hold him with one hand, and render him unconscious with the other. Yes, yeah, so he's grasping a hold of the jacket. And getting in some punches. So that takes us to the end of page 18. And a caption at the bottom says, continued in second page following. Gosh, I'm exhausted. Right, listeners, chart the progress of my voice as it deteriorates <laughs> through this episode as we have the smallest cast list we've ever had and I have to do all the talking. <laughs> so we arrive at the top of page 19. The spectre seems to have been successful. He's holding that ran by his collars and thinking. He has gone limp. Is he feigning unconsciousness? Or if I could only see him, make sure... And there's a little ripple of golden energy surrounding the spectre that moves into the next panel. Narkran falling in the ground, still surrounded by his golden aura. And the spectre's thinking, The darkness giving away to light. I'm beginning to see again. It is a sign I have triumphed over my evil enemy. The next panel sort of moves from the spectre's point of view to then show him lifting up Narkran's body. And as all this is going on, the spectre's thinking, The voice said I would be afflicted with a weakness during a period of stress. Blindness this time. And then we see the spectre, as you say, lifting up Narkran's body above his head. The spectre's thinking. The battle has ended, but the war is not yet won. So, we move to the top of page 20. The spectre looks down at Narkran's glowing body, and he's thinking. That parchment he was searching for is evil. Far too evil to let remain on earth. I must destroy it. But where on earth is it? My opponent possessed so much power that if he stepped on earth, he would immediately know where the parchment is. But I have no such power. If only I were in his shoes, I could. And then we get a close-up of the spectre. This is so well rendered. Mm -hmm. You really need to see this for yourself. Listen, it's yeah. stunning. It's almost like the spectre then says out loud, His shoes! That's it! We finally have something for Peter to say. A caption for this first <laughs> inset panel says, 
Quickly, the specter exchanges his footwear for that of the 18th century mystic. This is great, because there was a thing on Facebook last week. Someone had posted a drawing of the specter, mm-hmm. and someone commented on it saying, stupid-looking green pixie boots. <laughs> and I commented saying, what, the ones he's been wearing for over 80 years? And this guy <laughs> replied saying, hopefully he's not a listener. This chat replied saying, yeah, they always look stupid. I wonder what you would make of this. Yeah. As the spectre takes these little <laughs> brown shoes and puts them on over his green booties, because it looks even worse. Yes. So we can see that the, the golden aura that surrounded Narkran continues to surround the shoes as the spectre puts them on. And the spectre kneeling down and tying a shoelace is not something I thought I'd ever see. <laughs> but he's thinking, these shoes glow, as does the rest of him. That means that they must be empowered too. Then the next inset panel shows the spectre dropping feet first towards the surface of the earth. And a blocky caption says, Shortly. Indeed. And then the caption for the next panel says, Shortly as the ghostly guardian steps foot on earth. Yes, with a full moon looming in the background over the city. We see the... (laughs) This is hilarious. May have to put this on the socials. <laughs> We're spoilt for choice, actually, with this comic yeah. for what we could put on mm-hmm. the socials. There's loads. We see the, the spectre's shooed feet descending towards the pavement. Specs thinking, I can feel the lines of force making contact with the parchment. Then the final panel of page 20, with a full moon looming in the background, we see the spectre standing in front of a very raggedy, higgledy piggledy crooked old house. I mean, I'm reminded of the House of Mystery, or... Yeah, very much so. Uh-huh. Yeah, Or Mr. Gargoyle's house from the uh, Wonder Woman story ah, a while back. A deep cut, yes. A while back, but which our, our pal Gav probably just listened to for the first time last week at the time of the recording. <laughs> there you go, Gav, you got a shout-out. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm. So, Spectre now standing in front of this crooked old house as a full moon looms in the background, and he th- continues to think from the previous panel, leading to this old run-down house here in Salem. Ooh, will we see Dr. Fate? The parchment must have been moved here from England but its secret never unravelled. And in a very interesting way, the spectre then zooms up, twists around, and flies through one of the windows of the house. And a tiny caption says, Continued in the second page following. So as we arrive at the top of page 21, spectre has arrived inside the building. And this is hilarious. He's standing over a desk. We can see another painting with a ship on the wall. A painting that's obviously of someone else. He's standing over the desk. His feet, because he's wearing those shoes, are still glowing. And as he looks over the desk... Spectre's thinking. Strange. I know from my opponent's thoughts it was the last portion of this paper he was seeking to read. Yeah, there's books and parchment on the desk in front of him. But it was never completed. Whoever wrote this for some reason stopped in the middle of a sentence. Now that's interesting. Mm. So, Evil One's quest would have been in vain, even if I had not stopped him. A full moon looms through the window of the house in the next panels. The Spectre looks down at a bit of parchment on the desk, and he thinks... Nevertheless, this paper contains evil. Far too much. It must be destroyed before someone else finds it and attempts to use it. And he's obviously set the parchment on fire. Caption then for the next panel. The spectre burns the parchment, grinds the ashes into dust, and grabs the smoke from the fire before it can drift into the atmosphere. Very thorough. This panel shows the spectre flying up, away from Salem, out into space. Pity we didn't see Dr. Fate. Mm -hmm. Pity this wasn't actually a Dr. Fate story. Wow, yeah. Could have been. Could have worked, I suppose. We see the spectre is bearing the remnants of the parchment in his hand. It's leaving a trail behind him as he flies up, thinking, I will take this to the far reaches of the cosmic void, then release it. There, evil in it shall not affect Earth or any other world. And this next panel shows the spectre flying through a twisting black, purple and pink vortex. And as he's scooting along, he's thinking, It has been done. So he's obviously got rid of the remnants. Now to return these shoes to their owner and decide what is to be done with him. But no sooner is the footwear returned than... We can see that the spectre has put the shoes back onto Narkran. There's a massive golden glow, even bigger than what we saw before, coming up from him. The spectre recoils in the background, thinking, The glow about him intensifying. Massive energy building up inside him. I'd better get back. His existence is about to terminate. We arrive at the top of page 22. Suddenly, the void is rocked by a shattering explosion as the fate the evil one predicted for himself at last comes to pass. Yes, there is a massive BAROOM sound effect and a massive burst of red and orange and yellow fire as poor Narkran disintegrates. Gosh! Spectre standing astride the earth and lots of planets are floating around, so this must be again in some kind of astral plane equivalent. Spectre recoils, thinking, All his energy, all his power, flying out to the ends of the universe. We arrive on the final page of the story, page 23. 
Spectre still standing above the Earth, other weird planets floating around. Mm. It's a little cloud of dust, it looks like, in front of him. Spectre's thinking. He has not completely vanished. His essence is still intact, but every ounce of his power is gone. He's become like a burnt-out star, no longer a threat to anyone. And as the Astral Avenger returns to Earth... We're back in an alleyway with some detailed dustbins, <laughs> yes. and a full moon looms in the background as the Spectre flies down towards his other half, Jim Corrigan, and the Spectre thinks... Jim's caught up with the rest of that gang, just as he said he would. He still has a fire in his hands, but this time... I'm sure he can handle it himself. There's a nice comedy whack sound effect as Jim punches a guy and the guy's hat goes flying. And we conclude on a nice moody close-up of the spectre as he thinks, I shall never be allowed to forget that one rash moment of mine. It will haunt me the rest of my days. The end. Wow. Gosh. Right, I'm going for a lie down. <laughs> it's interesting you mentioned Dr. Fate there because all these spectre stories that we've read... I feel it was a missed opportunity to actually introduce Dr. Fate in them and actually have a team-up of some kind. Yes. That would have been great. That would have been really interesting. Or maybe have them pitted against each other for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. I think that would have been epic. But sadly, you know, we've not had that. Hey, there's still two issues to go. Who knows what will happen? That's true. I mean, because, you know, obviously we had the Spectre and teaming up with Wildcat and we had the appearance mm -hmm. from the, the Psycho Pirate. Yep. And our man shared issue seven, even though the characters didn't meet. But it seems baffling that Dr. Fate didn't turn up. Imagine Dr. Fate turned up in one of the Neil Adams drawn issues. I know. Yes. Even if he'd turned up once he got to Salem. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. the Spectre could have been permanently blinded and maybe Dr. Fate could have played his case or something. I don't know. Maybe the parchment was being held in Dr. Fate's tower. Yeah. That would have been interesting. That would have been terrific if there'd been room in the story for a bit of conflict between them. Mm -hmm. What do you think of it overall then? I really enjoyed this. It was absolutely fantastic. The artwork is astounding. I know before you said in the previous Grandinetti Anderson stories that basically the Spectre looks as if it's a Murphy Anderson Spectre. I can't say that for this particular story. Yes. I would agree. Some of the close-ups of the Spectre are like, totally unlike Murphy Anderson's. Mm. I mean, there's a close-up on page eight. Yep. There's a close-up when he meets God. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's a couple of close-ups that are on page 15. They do not look like Murphy Anderson. In fact, the one at the top of page 15, he actually looks really gaunt and kind of mm. old. He actually looks like Peter Cushing round about Star Wars era. Yeah. At the top of that page. I get that. I think on page 17, 16 and 17, he maybe looks a little bit more like it, especially panel two, page 17, it looks a little bit more like a regular Murphy Anderson. Yeah, but I think this is yeah. all because Jerry's got a bit more confident in his storytelling and mm -hmm. the Spectre, the way it's been rendered, it's there's not the same opportunity for the for Murphy just to draw a regular Spectre over it. Yeah. It's very Jerry, so to speak. Yeah. Very Jerry. Very Jerry. Also, I found it quite amusing that we saw more soles of shoes in this story than we do in an average Jim Lee comic. <laughs> That's in something. Imagine Rob Layfield had had to draw this one. It would have been hopeless. <laughs> can he not just borrow his jacket? <laughs> or can he not borrow his wristband or something? <laughs> or some pouches. Can we not borrow some pouches? <laughs> yes, could um, Narkran have some pouches, please? <laughs> it was very different. Uh -huh. Steve Skeets right now, obviously, it's quite different from the structure we've got used to. I mean, yeah. It didn't really involve a, a trippy battle through the dimensions for the last third. I mean, they, yeah. admittedly, they were probably fighting in the astral plane above the Earth, but the whole uh -huh. Spectre being called up for a disciplinary was very interesting, wasn't it? Yeah. And the Spectre thinking, it's a dream? Does the Spectre dream? What? That's news to me. That's a fascinating idea as well. Uh huh. Does he dream? Does he ever go to the dream dimension? And Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Is he vulnerable there? You know, you think he might be. Ah, that's so interesting. It is interesting. I mean, and as I think I said when during the process there, like reading the the John Ostrander Tom Andrick series, you get quite used to sort of the spectre talking to the voice mm -hmm. of whoever has given him his mission. Yeah. And it's quite interesting to see it rendered in such a way here with with the pearly gates and the pillars and stuff and the mm -hmm. and the doves and all that symbolism. That was quite interesting. That was very unlike what we've had before. Yeah. When I was young, I always used to think that the voice that gave the Spectre his powers was the same as the voice that gave Hawk and Dove their powers. Obviously, that was retconned, and they became like avatars of Lords of Order and Chaos, Hawk and Dove. But I always thought, just because mm. they were both referred to as just this mm -hmm. mysterious voice, mm -hmm. I thought, oh, oh, could it be the same thing? Yeah, I mean, of course, at this point, you know, we've, we've talked about Doctor Fate. Doctor Fate is still just the guy with the, the Egyptian magic and jaggedy lightning bolt hands. He's, he hasn't started mm. manifesting his power through angst. No, not yet. He doesn't get affected by the whole Lords of Chaos and Order blight until well into the 80s. I'm not even sure if we'll, if we'll do any of those stories. I can't remember. We'll have to keep our eyes peeled and 
how Doctor Fate changes and yep. such like. But my limited experience of Hawk and Dove, I think I'd probably drawn the same conclusion. Yeah. It also kind of ties in with, you know, some of the stuff with Dead Man that I'm vaguely aware of as well. You know, the sense of some higher power that's going, right, I need you to do this for me. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. That one is a named character, though. That's a named deity, as it were. Yeah, yeah, and, and of course, and we should also remember at this point, the Spectre was still an Earth Two. Dead Man's very much probably an Earth One character, but it's, yes, it's uh-huh. the similarities I think between them are, are obvious. You know, a dead guy mm-hmm. brought back to life to do some stuff and things. You know, there's, yeah. there's a real similarity. Mm-hmm. Quite used to this point, as you know, as we've discussed, Jerry's very individual art style, the slightly caricatured yeah. features and people in the very stylistic ways of rendering backgrounds. It's it's a bit of a feast for the eyes. It must be said. I'm still missing. Mr. Adams. Uh-huh. But I think looking at this, I think if Neil had drawn this, it maybe would have flown a little too closer towards what he was doing with Dead Man. Mm-hmm. I think it's probably good that he wasn't on this one. I mean, there's some brilliant stuff, like, you know, when we first get the caption for the story, page seven, and then the spectre coming out of Jim's body as he sleeps. Yeah. That is just gorgeous. Yeah. It's very, very effective. What Jerry's doing, I think, really suits the story. Do you think that painting of the clipper ship that's above Jim's bed, I think that's a gift from Mona Marcy, who we haven't seen for about yes. <laughs> uh, eight issues? pretty much yeah it's interesting i think i think we were i can't remember if we were talking about this in real life the other day but you know we've speculated quite a lot about why the the book wasn't a success i mean it's only got two mm-hmm. issues left mm-hmm. and it reformats hugely in the final two issues yeah pete and i were chatting in real life the other day and sort of speculating that you know what this comic would have been like if it had been you know a little bit more marvel style if we did a lot yeah. more about the trials and tribulations of jim corrigan's civilian identity and all that sort of stuff and Spectre to rocking up at inconvenient moments. We had a couple of sequences with that sort of stuff, but it's interesting yeah. that the more we've gone on, the less Jim Corrigan there's been. Mm-hmm. Really, yeah, that's quite interesting. Yes, one of my favourite parts of this was when uh, the voice, when giving the Spectre his reprimand, says, "I will I give, give you, you a plot, plot convenient, convenient weakness." weakness. So, <laughs> does he see that? <laughs> if only. <laughs> it's pretty much. Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this, this weakness, weakness will change, change depending on what's, what's needed for the story. story. Yes, it'll be interesting to see if, if the weakness aspect continues in the next issue at all. Yeah, or if it's just dropped entirely. So many changes have happened in this title, Yeah, you know, over the course of it. There's been so many fairly similar stories, but in so many attempts to shake it up. Mm. And we're not even finished yet. It's really interesting. Yeah. Do you know what it's, it's reminded me of, actually? Mm-hmm. It, like, it reminded me of Spitfire and the Troubleshooters from the new universe. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Which seemed to get reformatted drastically from the top down every issue once it got past like, issue six. Yeah. You know, before they finally kept the cancelled it like, three or four later. It's like, right, it's just going to be Spitfire and the, the suit's going to look like this. No, we're going to get rid of the backing cast. No, we're now going to do this with it completely, but we're going to put Starbrand <laughs> in because someone might buy it if we put it on the cover. I think that was Carrie Bates, I think. The drastic reformatting of it is, is interesting. I mean, in our preparation, I'd sort of suggested to Peter that we condense and do issues 9 and 10 in one go. Mm-hmm. But I think we'll keep doing them separately just to kind of, yeah. because as I've said many times, the Spectre's like pretty much the, the sole mm-hmm. representation of the JSA at this point. And we've come this far. <laughs> yeah, because as we'll say, the, the reformatting in 9 and 10 is really, really different to mm-hmm. what's gone before. I mean, it's even more of a, a jump than just the, the change of art from Neil Adams to, to Jerry Grandinetti. It's very interesting. Yeah. Sadly, there's no more letters pages to talk about. No. So we're not really sure what was going on as far as the behind the scenes or what people were thinking at this point. Mm-hmm. There's a text page in issue 10, though, which I will read the last paragraph of when we get to that, yeah. just, and we can speculate on that. I really enjoyed this issue. It didn't feel too formulaic in the way that some of the other ones had done, you know? True, true. It felt a bit more lively, and if, you know, maybe if they'd given Steve Skeets a good shot, I think he might have been able to come up with some new ideas. All in all, if you'd bought this off the rack back in 1968, you'd be absolutely thrilled. When you get the Nick Cardi cover, yeah. the EC comic style splash page with Jerry Grandinetti is phenomenal. Yeah. The whole story is, is really gripping and engaging. Then the Spectre meets God. We're just going to call him God, because that's, that's what it is. Yeah, other deities are available. And, you know, you've got Jim Corrigan actually properly in danger. Yes. And the Spectre just overreacting and yes. still being unaware of what he's done. Yeah. I find the punishment is aspect of it really weird in that he's being punished and he's totally unaware of the fact that he injured this human. Yes. He's been told that he has, but he's, he's unaware of it. It's not like he was shown what he's done and then he has to pay penance for it. I th- was expecting the person who got injured to turn up and be relevant to the story again. Yeah. Perhaps involved in some way in defeating Narkran or whatever. Mm-hmm. What would have happened then if the Spectre had been so weakened that he hadn't been able to stop Narkran and Narkran had then gone on and destroyed the Earth? <laughs> you know, yeah, but obviously he has his wits about him and he, uses his yeah. power, he learns to use his powers in a different way. Maybe yeah. that was the lesson he was supposed to learn. 
not to use, just rely on on brute force to to be a bit cleverer. But that was interesting. What what if the spec hadn't beaten them? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, it depends how long Narkran still had to live because obviously you know the, That's true. the rest of the text wasn't there. So would he have taken out the rest of the earth in a blaze of glory? Yeah, I mean, we should talk about that too. The fact that the master, you know, the, the older gentleman at the start, didn't finish writing the text down, probably yeah. because he realised what would happen if he did. Uh -huh. That was quite interesting, the way that mm -hmm. sort of fed back. It was a really, really quite an intelligent sort of written story, I think, compared, yeah. to, as, a, as we've said, to the more formulate Gardner ones that we've got used to. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is light years away from issue one. Oh, yes. No Captain Skull here. No, this is this is fantastic. You know, it's light years away from that. I could put them side by side. Uh -huh. and it's, it's stunning, the difference between them. Yeah. I'm just, again, wondering at the Grandinetti Anderson uh, combination here because they're just fantastic together. The, again, the colours are so vibrant. We've spoken mm -hmm. about this for the last issue as well. Mm -hmm. It's really incredible. It's so different from the stories that we've had before. It's just amazing. Yeah, it really pops. And they've obviously benefited from having that, those extra colours being added to their yep, palette, palette that we talked about a few, yeah. a few episodes ago. It's mm -hmm. very, very effective. Yeah, very enjoyable. Must be said, yeah. very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. It lives up to the to the cover. Yes, absolutely. Uh -huh. Even though the cover, obviously, as we said, has no bearing on the story. It's still, nope. yeah, it was worth it. Satisfaction guaranteed, I think, with that one. Yep, without a doubt. So that's what we thought about this story. Now, what did you think about it? Please get in touch. You can email us at the Earth 2 podcast at gmail.com. And if you do so, we will give you a shout out on the show, maybe even read out your email. Make sure you follow us on social media because we're posting up some bonus material for this issue, as ever. On Facebook and Instagram, we're at the Earth 2 Podcast, and on Twitter, we're at podcast underscore Earth 2, and it's the number two for all our social media. Yep, check out Instagram and Facebook. As usual, we'll have the, the Digest reprint cover from this one, and I think we've got the Australian cover mm. for the reprint as well. So yes, worth, worth keeping an eye out for. Bit of context, bit of bonus. Indeed. You know how it works. So yes. On that bombshell, I've been Peter. And I've been David. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again soon on... The Earth 2 Podcast. Transmatter cube activated. Return coordinate set for Earth Prime. And is it? Um, I've forgotten his name. Hang on. <laughs> I've forgotten his name. Nakran, isn't it? That was me miming, ed That's me miming editing there. It's not it. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> and, I'll, okay. and I'll have to edit this out now. So <laughs> <laughs> that's your outtake. <laughs>